So, it's another one of these videos. Yes, welcome everyone. Those of you who know my content know that I tend to be more of an optimist when it comes to certain situations around Destiny. Today is sort of a video like that, but it's only optimism in the face of the overwhelming reality of what's happening to Destiny at the moment. As a general rule of thumb, let me put this out first. I don't like to talk doom and gloom about a game because in my opinion it's not always helpful to the developers, or to me as a content creator. That's a stance that has evolved over time. I certainly did not used to be that way. Aside from anything else, if I'm talking about a game that I'm actively making content on and saying only doom and gloom things and saying only that it's doomed, why would any of you want to play it? Why would any of you want to spend time with it or hear about the stories in it? I don't think that makes sense. If I genuinely think that there is no future for a game, I won't make any more content on it. Take a look at what happened with Anthem. I had plans to cover the entirety of that game's content and lore, and by the point at which I found myself falling asleep in my chair at approximately 1pm, reading through lore stuff or trying to get all the dialogue from the game, I called it quits there. When I do make negative content nowadays, I want to try and do something where I am providing flaws and critiques for people to look at, and then trying to show what a path forward might be. I see my role as a content creator as someone in this space who is able to collaborate between the community and the developers, allowing the community to voice their concerns by just being tapped into the general discourse, and then signal boosting that for the developers. And I know that I have a reputation as being an optimist, but I also like to hope that lots of you know that I do give things a fair swing. And you think I can't be critical about things? Well, check back on my stuff during Lightfall. My initial thoughts on things 24 hours in got to number 12 on trending across YouTube generally. Not trending in gaming, trending across the whole platform. It now has 700,000 views, and I count it as a dubious honour because I know that the thumbnail was seen by about 10 times as many people as watched the actual video. Thumbnails are not nuanced, they don't give you the same opinion as the video I'm making, they can't give you all the context. It's my only real regret about that situation, alongside the fact that we all seem to be somewhat incapable of nuance from time to time. No matter what, I think I'm putting my point forward as this. I do not want to make negative content about a game generally, but I think that there is a point to it, which is why I want to go ahead and continue to take the approach that I've tried to take for the last few years, which is, this is the problem, what's the solution? So yeah, let's apply that to Destiny and to Destiny's big problems right now. The franchise, needless to say, is not doing well. Everyone loves to look at player chart numbers, and, I mean, the situation with Concord has only revealed why those things can be so important, but I think it's also worth remembering that we are not exactly there yet. And it's worth noting that at this exact moment in time, the current depression in player numbers is going to be particularly pronounced because people are going to be playing things like Black Ops 6 and Space Marine 2, which, spoiler alert, that's coming to the channel in a day or so as well. However, if we want to look at Destiny's major problems overall, I think there are three major problems plaguing it at the moment. And those are poor executive leadership, poor player morale due to a perpetual permacrisis feeling within the media narrative of the game, and a lack of a forward-facing narrative chase that shows us that there will be a future for the game. Some of those things can be fixed a lot more easily than others. But let's talk about each of these issues, and then also see if we can find a solution. So, first issue, poor executive leadership. I'm sure that you have heard this song and dance before, but I think it's no less important to mention it, especially now. When it comes to the poor leadership at Bungie, I think it is important to clarify what I mean. If you are a newcomer, you might not understand the dynamic, because for many of us, we're just gamers, and Bungie, as a studio, is just a homogenous entity. It's a company that is sort of faceless and responsible for all the good and all the bad that happens to Destiny. The reality is that in any studio, you will have a lot of roles that one could class as quote-unquote leadership in one way or another. For example, if you're looking at the sandbox team for Bungie, you've got people like Chris Proctor, who is a senior design lead and is responsible for how our weapons feel and how their perks interact with the game. He has a team that works with him on the sandbox, and he leads them. His work in the game speaks for itself. That is an example of solid leadership. Our guns may be somewhat power-crept, and there may be a problem with that, 
But I think it would sound undeniably stupid to say that Destiny doesn't have good-feeling weapons, or that the perks don't create some satisfying moments within the gameplay. So again, that is results right there, that is a proof of solid leadership. But he is not the kind of leader we're talking about though, which is why I want to clarify this at the very beginning. I say now, it is not about leadership within the development side of Bungie, it is poor executive leadership. That is your C-suite team, your CEO, your CFO, etc. This is a group who is internally referred to as the Bungie leadership team. This is the C-suite executive group. And for years, we didn't really shave off that group to judge them separately from other developers in the studio. Within Bungie's own internal marketing and even the story of the studio, there was an attempt to propagate this idea that Bungie was a family, and that every level of the studio, from QA all the way up to the executives, was somewhat indivisible from each other. However, that narrative has really started to change, especially in the last few years. It really kicked off, though, around the time of the first round of layoffs back in November of 2023. The actions of the Bungie executive team, the Bungie leadership team, have since that moment received a lot more scrutiny from the community, but the developers at Bungie, the day-to-day -day people actually working on the game? Yeah, the ones who have left the studio in particular? They've been raising the alarm bells about this for quite some time. Clarion calls have been going on about what's wrong with the upper management at Bungie for years now. The complaints so many of us veteran players have heard over the years have been dropped in dozens of different articles throughout the years, and in many cases they seem to cite a repeating pattern. Management at the very top of Bungie is inflexible, unwilling to enact changes that the developers know the community wants, and they refuse to reassign resources to deal with particular pain points. This all makes a lot more sense in the context of what we've learned recently, but let's stay on target for the moment. The more recent round of layoffs back at the end of July also seem to bring about the implication that the Bungie leadership team is incredibly out of touch. That's an assertion that's been rammed home with the supposed report that, inside the leadership team, they thought that the latest round of layoffs, quote, went well, as well as the previous note of employees asking if Bungie's executive bonuses and pay might be cut to prevent future layoffs, only to receive a reply of, no, we're not that sort of company, and of course, the critique of the wild spending that some of the executives have undertaken in their lifestyles, even as hundreds of their employees are being laid off. And of course, the most common critique and example of that is the infamous car collection of Bungie's CEO, Pete Parsons. A collection that continued to grow mere days after the first round of layoffs. A collection he was giving private tours to in 2024, when other layoffs would be planned for. Leadership, at least from the perspective from which I speak, and from the perspectives of the developers who've made their voices clear, is seemingly where the lion's share of problems that Bungie faces seem to originate from. And just to take a step back with my own personal feelings, I don't know what the solution here is, but it is clear that it has to be one of resignations or a dramatic change in the approach of the executive team, it appears that, in due time, Sony will properly and fully acquire Bungie and will basically just sublimate the studio into their own enterprises, which might relieve Pete Parsons from some of his duties. But again, it's not just about Pete, and I don't know if that is the right call because at the end of the day, I speak from a biased position. I would certainly like to be correct, and regardless of what the correct call is, whether it's for him to step down or for there to be a dramatic change in approach, I think there should be consequences for the failures of what he's done thus far. Regardless of whether that's the case or not, I think it all goes back to the same point. Leadership has always been something that has affected Destiny in a dramatic fashion, and almost always for the worst. And let me be really clear about this. That has the ability to just fade into jargon, right? It could just be something of me sitting there and grinding an axe. But there is actionable experience from players and from reports inside the studio that corroborates this. I mean, to give you just a few examples from player experiences, are you a PvP player who for the last three, four, five years has been begging for something more to be added to the Crucible and for it to be supported? Well, you can lay that decision at the feet of the Bungie leadership team, who sent a lot of the core PvP team to work on Marathon and left you guys high and dry. Are you, like me, a story fan, who was disappointed in Lightfall's story? Well, if word is to be believed and Bungie's leadership did cut the final shape out of Lightfall in order to create an extra year's worth of content, from next to nothing, we will have them to thank for that. 
It's no surprise, really, that we didn't get any explanation about what the Veil was when it had to be saved for Season of the Deep. Again, that's all speculative, but I think it's so close to the truth that if someone did come out to confirm that it's not the case, you'd have some counter-arguments from other prior developers. And on the flip side, more general point of things, for gamers out there who may not have jumped into Destiny at all, are you someone who wanted to play Destiny but realized how aggressive the Eververse monetization was, the fact that the dungeon passes are sold separately, and the fact that we are one of the only full-price paid games in the industry that has the gall to monetize transmog of all things? Your aesthetic, your fashion, alongside a full-paid game? Yeah, I think it's not surprising if you were one of those people who saw that, saw how aggressive it was, and realized that the game wasn't for you. And that's another decision we can probably lay at the feet of Bungie's leadership. You're starting to get the point? Because whilst individual developers and focused teams might make the game and all its different components, the big picture decisions about resource allocation, how the studio is managed, and how products are released, all of those go through leadership in one way or another. Hell, even if they don't actually touch those decisions directly, they run the ship. The expectation is for them to steward the vessel well, for them to steward the franchises under their studio well, and they have not done that. There are some instances where it is blaringly obvious why Destiny has had the problems it's had, and how that pertains to leadership. In other things, you can extrapolate from why that might be the case. Bungie's leadership team has clearly not been doing any of this stewarding successfully, so my first suggestion to fix anything in Destiny has to start with them. As I said before, they either need to be changed out and removed, or they need to have a fundamental shift in their attitude and approach as to be so unrecognizable from their current selves that we genuinely feel as though there is a possibility that we might be able to right this ship. I personally, from my own biased perspective, would be very willing to write off Pete Parsons at this moment. I think that he has not shepherded this franchise or his studio well. I am not going to sit here and pretend like we're going to see that happen anytime soon though. Very rarely will you actually sit there and see executives face the consequences for their poor management. No, those decisions are heaped upon the shoulders of those lower down, whose jobs are more expendable. From here though, you get all of the typical stuff that we've seen over the last 10 months, where there are terrible articles about the way that Bungie is, and how layoffs have affected the company, about how some people were at their desks crying, about how some people had moved their entire lives to work for the studio and had then been laid off only a few months later. And from here, all of the other problems stem. And it leads us to the next really big one that I want to touch on, which can generally be summed up with two words. Bad morale. For every single bad article about Bungie or Destiny that's been released over the years, there is a hidden cost. That cost is expressed in two metrics. Players who leave, and the morale of the players who stay. When a game has a positive buzz about it, as a player, you can tell, you can feel it through social media and with the people that you're playing with, or just simply with the activity in the game. But the same goes for negative sentiment. To put it really simply, if your game community has poor morale, it is going to lead to them not wanting to pick the game up anymore. Destiny has chronic problems with this, it has for years. The layoffs are by far the biggest example of recent instances that have triggered what I would consider a morale collapse. If you've recently seen someone quote tweeting or posting anywhere on social media something about Bungie from a news article headline and then quoting, it's Jova, then yeah, that's what this looks like. That is low morale. That is a morale collapse. That is people believing the game has no future because the headlines are so bad, because sentiment around the game is terrible, regardless of what the quality of the game is like. And it's worth remembering, if you were to objectively judge Destiny on all of the merits that it has as a game, there's a lot to stack up there that's really good. Even take a look at the final shape. It was critically acclaimed and is judged as one of the best expansions in the history of the game. But that doesn't matter right now, because it's not about whether the game is good or not, it is about perceptions. And Bungie has a massive perception problem. Low morale is also a double-edged sword because not only does it slowly bleed to the player base dry as more and more people leave, but it also keeps potential new players away. 
You remember what it was like when you were all watching Anthem die the death that it did? Do you remember wanting to actually get on and play that game? I think not, and that's because everything about the game was screaming at you to keep away from the damn thing. Some of this sentiment is reinforced by news outlets and content creators, and undoubtedly there are absolutely bad faith actors that drive some of this stuff about games out of proportion for the sake of their own bottom line. But even with the presence of bad faith actors, sometimes the presence of bad morale is unmistakable. Every single headline creates bad perceptions, which means bad morale. And bad morale is only made worse when half of these headlines are created by what I might very generously call unforced errors. Let me give you an example. If a game-breaking bug takes the game offline for a week, that's one thing. It's an honest mistake, the devs work to fix it, everyone's human, it's not the end of the world. But when it's something about the conduct of individuals at the studio for egregious actions ranging from harassment and bigotry to mismanagement and greed, those are not mistakes that people look kindly on. Bungie as a workplace has an incredibly mixed reputation. Outwardly, the studio tries to present itself as a great place to work, boasting talented individuals and in an inclusive work environment. News articles tell us that there, oh god, um, there have been rampant issues within the studio, and they have led to the dismissal of many a Bungie employee. The most recent instance that comes to mind, of course, is that of Christopher Barrett, but there have been many more before, and frankly, the list is long. These are what I would call, and I say this with the note that it omits the terrible amount of pain and suffering that other people have suffered from the actions of these people, unforced errors that arise from people within the company basically just being awful. And sadly, we need to point out the most vacuous part of this, because despite the fact that that real suffering is terrible, it's not that that we're actually talking about here. It's the perception we're talking about. Because if that's the buzz around your game and your company the whole time, people are actively going to stay away with it and not engage with the stuff you create. Even when you look at something which is fairly commonplace in the industry, such as greed, many practices that create that sort of atmosphere and miasma around your studio that tells players to stay away is harmful. It's why I had a very easy time recently jumping back into Monster Hunter World with my friends, where there is bare minimum monetization, and the focus is squarely on the content, and all the content updates with the exception of Iceborne, which is a full-blown expansion, were free. This is the effect of that bad perception, and that is how you get bad morale. Those who do stay around within a game that has terrible morale feel the depressing weight of it all. You want to know why so many content creators in the Destiny scene, myself included, feel burnt out right now or have just outright left? Look no further than the morale situation, which at least in my opinion arose in part because of unforced errors. Of course, it is bigger than just that. Lightfall, the rounds of layoffs, general incompetence from studio leadership, all of these had their part to play. And it's just added to this general miasma of failure around Destiny and Bungie, something which news headlines now salivate for. But unfortunately, the problem goes even deeper than that, because of course each niche within the game's greater community has its own problems, and the morale of different groups can go up or down to varying degrees. The PvP community has, well, seen very few high morale moments in the last five years. There has not been a lot to love. I would say that they have suffered the most, and my friends, who used to really enjoy PvP, they have basically left. Hell, they'd left years ago. They came back for the big expansions and maybe did the seasonal story begrudgingly, but they were not fans of Destiny anymore because the PvP wasn't serving them. But again, PvP is just one example of one niche. I represent part of another niche, which is the lore community. We've had our own few moments of major calamity, such as Lightfall, but for the most part, things have been steady or even in a nice place for the last five years or so. Except, of course, when the last two years are concerned. The reason I bring all of this up is because beyond the greater scope of general community morale, each of these micro-communities within the game individually are all bearing different burdens at different points, and they all needed to be tended to. And in a lot of instances, Bungie's team were well aware of the pain points, but they weren't able to fix them. The example that once again stands out to me is the Crucible community, because everyone who they needed in order to create more PvP content, they had been siphoned off to work on Marathon. So how do we fix this? Well, 
Oh god, uh, the problem is that fixing bad morale within any game's community is a multifaceted project. For general low morale across the entirety of the game, there needs to be some discipline within the upper ranks of the studio, in Bungie's case, although generally problem actors need to be removed. Remove the rot. I don't care who it is, get them out. Break the old studio culture that might have led to that behavior being allowed to flourish. Beyond this though, the bigger challenge of course is creating content for the game that goes beyond the minimum viable product that players feel like they've been getting with Destiny for a very long time. Not my words either, it's been going on since even before Lightfall. Earning the community's trust and fixing the game on those micro levels within individual smaller communities is a whole task in itself. It represents and presents another issue for Destiny. The way to fix this generally would be communication within the community, to listen to their requests and feedback, and to implement different things that address those concerns or add new reasons for people to play and be delighted. However, this has led to a very simple and repeated phrase from the Bungie team for years, which is, we're listening. And any Destiny player who has been around here in the endgame and the hardcore community for a long time has gotten very tired of sitting there and hearing those words of we're listening without any follow-up showing that we're acting. And we all know whose feet to lay the blame for that at, but at the same time, it doesn't change how we feel, and morale is all about how we feel and perceive things. A long time ago, a lot of us would have solely laid it at the feet of the devs, but now it's clear that a lot of the community requests were actually being heard, but there was no way of them being implemented because of the roadblock that was the executive team and their mismanagement of the studio's various assets. The problem and the solution both arise from the core point that for a live service game in particular, your community is your lifeblood. Without them, you're dead in the water. It's not just your core community playing the game every day either though, it's how you project yourself further out into the general sphere of people who might pick up and play your game. Let me give you an example. Years back, a very uncelebrated thing happened near the beginning of Warframe's life cycle. Players discovered cool movement tech, using a pair of dual melee weapons which allowed them to move across the map at incredible speed. I remember, I played Warframe back before Destiny even released. I used that tech. It was awesome, it was fun. The weapons weren't even particularly powerful in all builds, but it was great. You had your dual axes and you just flew. Now here's the thing, the developer of Warframe Digital Extremes would have been well within their right to patch it out and prevent such movement from being a core part of their game. Instead, they saw that players loved that movement and built upon it to create what Warframe's movement is today. At their best, live studios have moments like this that build player trust and reinforce good player morale. At their worst, they tarnish their own reputations and break the foundations upon which they are built by removing the reasons players are there in the first place, to have fun and enjoy the game. So that's a really large issue, but thanks to management being around for as long as they have, these issues have existed in one way or another in Destiny for years, be they poor player morale or just poor leadership at the studio generally. But in the wake of the final shape, we have a third problem, an entirely different one that we need to deal with. Something that has not happened in the entirety of Destiny's life cycle, even through all the lows, like Curse of Osiris and the Dark Below, and the post-Taken King Great Malaise before the April update, and the time when we were sitting there after Lightfall. Now we have an entirely different problem, and it's this. People don't know what the future of Destiny looks like. So let's start this third problem by asking a question. Why do live service games have roadmaps? Well, it's the promise of future content being released, of course. The idea that your continual investment is going to be rewarded with some great payoff down the road, with more things to do, with more fun to find, with more weapons to chase, with more enemies to defeat, with more stories to experience. For the longest time, Destiny's light and dark saga was building to a final confrontation in the final shape, and frankly, I don't feel ashamed of saying that it was brilliant. There are so many people out there who enjoyed the final shape. It is unquestionably the best expansion released in Destiny to date, and for a few short months morale and sentiment was at an all-time high. Players were satisfied with the state of the game, and a big part of that was because the story of the last 10 years had come to an end. 
We entered the heart of the Traveler. We reunited with our old friend Cade. We defeated the Witness and we saw Crow finally take his place within the Vanguard. We watched those lanterns rise over the last city and it felt like the full stop at the end of a sentence. A messy and often disjointed one, but a beautiful one nonetheless. But then there comes the inevitable question. What next? For many Destiny players, there is little reason to continue playing narratively and little reason to continue playing generally. And I wanted to show you some examples of some clips from other community members' content and it just gives you a little bit more of a demonstration from this. Take a listen to both Datto and Cross. I know we've had these uncertain times in the past, these kinds of videos, these kinds of updates, but it's a little bit different now that the main story of Destiny is completely wrapped. We have no big horizon to look at and that there's been two rounds of layoffs at Bungie in less than a year. That it's probably time for Bungie to start talking about their plans. And I do expect to hear from them sometime, definitely before the end of the year, ideally the next two months, really ideally as soon as humanly possible, um, about their plans for after episode three. Like, are we going into episode four? Are we starting a new era of the game? Like, what are we doing? You know, I literally weep because there are no worlds left to conquer. And that's just gonna happen after so many hours in the game, right? It's my job to play the game and cover the game. Eventually, I'm gonna do all the things. All time love. I can't tell you how many times we've put out a weapon review or a guide. And dude, I get a wave of comments from people who are like, what, what's the point of doing that now? And that's because I really feel like we're in a similar situation to what Marvel found themselves in after Thanos was killed. Spoilers. But I mean, like after Thanos was killed, did anybody really care about the Avengers? The big bad was defeated. The witness was defeated. And I remember like whenever, you know, the last Avengers movie was over, Endgame was over, it was just like, all right, I'm done. I literally was like done. And then and I remember sat down like and watched a Marvel movie. God, since probably, probably Avengers. I feel like we're in a similar situation with the Destiny universe. Even, even way back in Beyond Lights, there was always like that bad, that bad that we're working toward. The pyramid ships. Who is this race of enemies that we are approaching? Who is this witness? And we were working toward that. And, and now we've kind of just that's gone, that's done. And I know like the, the lore implications in the raid were huge because we found out from that, that the witness was not the winner. The winner even sent us a message. My concern is that things are just, I feel like things are very slow moving right now. And I feel like sentiment is at an all time low. And I'm just concerned that things are gonna just keep treading lower before Bungie's like, hey, here's our plans for the future. And dare I say, here's our next saga. What's the point of grinding? What's the point of obtaining more powerful gear? And this is where I think story and narrative is important. It gives you that context, that reason for why you should. So sooner rather than later, I think it would be wise if Bungie addressed this and gave us that why. And God dog it, I hope it's a good why, you know? I hope it's a good reason for all of us to continue to reinvest, you know, back in Destiny for the future. Y'all remember when Bungie came out and said, this is what we have coming over the next three years. Y'all remember when we got hit with like these, these screenshots or th this, this was the poster. This was the main poster that I remember we got hit with. Y'all remember when we got hit with this and then, and then eventually they added final shape. This is when it was like, oh wow. Okay. Bungie's cooking. Cause it was like, boom, this is what's about to go down. And that made us say as a community, okay, there's a lot more that's going to be happening here way beyond what we got. There's a lot that's touched on on both those videos, and I highly recommend that you see both of them. You'll find them linked down below in the description, unless I forget, in which case the comments will be pestering me to put them up, rightly so. But I think the common thread that is picked up by both Datu and Cross is that the story of Destiny for them has just ended. There is nothing left to conquer. There are no villains that need to be defeated. The way that Datu puts this is more about content in his latter note, and about how the game has no more challenge left, but his original statement about the game being wrapped up makes it clear that the game doesn't feel like it has a horizon. And I think Cross makes the point even more succinctly when he talks about how Marvel ended the entire saga of Thanos and, well, all the interest just kind of dropped off the MCU. We finished our saga, we had our fun, we conquered our big bad in the form of the pyramids, but things are slow moving now, and the game continues, but We've all been here and we've finished our ride and now some people have gotten off. 
Now, I think it's really important to also point this out. Credit to the narrative team where it is due, they have teased something even darker on the horizon in the lore, and my own analytics from videos talking about the Winnower, the potential next villain of Destiny, make it clear that there is a degree of interest and excitement around the game. However, after having just finished a 10-year saga, I think Bungie has missed a moment here. Yes, we had our Path Forward video that we got a few months ago, which told us that we'd have episodes and then frontiers. But that's not enough, because when Destiny started, we saw this. A 10-year story. A 10-year saga. That was the sign for me at the very beginning of my Destiny life cycle that it was going to be something I wanted to invest my time in. It was telling me that this will be something I will play for the next decade. And you know what? As I'm recording this, it is September 4th. We are five days away from the 10 year anniversary of this game. I have been playing it for 10 years. That promise panned out. For all the bad and the good that happened in between, that one clarion call that this was going to be a saga that lasted for 10 years, that rung true. It was correct. However, after finishing this 10 year saga, I think Bungie has dropped the ball. I think they needed to immediately signpost that we were going to be building towards another saga, or that we would be starting one immediately, so that people knew that they were still going to be able to invest their time in Destiny, so that people knew that there was a future for this game. Because you know what? A big part of the doom and gloom around Destiny is about the question of whether or not it has a future. And if Bungie does not believe it has a future and is being tight-lipped about what happens and is only giving us a one-year roadmap for the future, which includes a lot of stuff that has a lot of question marks about it, then yeah, why are we supposed to invest our time in any of this? For a game like Destiny, an existential goal like this is a part of why players keep playing. Raiders got more powerful to face the next big foe on day one raids, to defeat the next raid boss, to see what villain the story would conjure next. And these villains would be telegraphed in the story for years sometimes, building their presence in the background, giving us an idea of what might happen in the future, something that we would need to face off against one day, a terrible evil that only we could defeat. I think a part of what made the Witch Queen in the final shape, and arguably even Forsaken, so good was the fact that we'd wanted to face off against these main villains for so long, and we got entire expansions devoted to them. Whether it was Aldrin Sarv, the snarky prince that had always threatened us from the beginning of D1, whether it was Savathun, one of the greatest villains in Destiny's history, or whether it was the Witness, the big bad of all, the one who caused the collapse and wanted to enact the final shape. Let me tell you, when Witch Queen came along and when Savathun was teased relentlessly for half a decade, only to arrive in fanfare, that was brilliant. And that was something that kept me playing, because I knew we would get a taste of Savathun's story at some point, and I knew that we were going to be involved. But now, even with the Winnower, we have no indication of who our next big villain is going to be. This is not like before. There is no hint that the Cabal Emperor is on the way. There is no writing on the wall that the Black Fleet will arrive soon. There is no cry out into the night for Oryx to hear anymore. There is no warning from Savathun in her moment of defeat that the Witness is on its way. Destiny, narratively, still has massive future events that might pan out, but its major villains all connected to the Witness, and for many people, that means that the plot has just run out of road. Certainly, there are clearly telegraphed events down the road in Destiny's story that a lot of people will be looking at as potential jumping off points for the plot. The battle to retake the Cabal homeworld, and the upcoming return of the Dreadnought clearly stand out. But these alone are not enough to keep people around. Narratively, we need to know that we're going to be working towards the next grand villain that we'll defeat. We need to know that there's going to be another 10-year saga, or at very least, another 5-year saga, or at very least, a future for Destiny. And this time, Bungie is going to need to do more right than they've done before. Narratively, we need to be directed at the Winnower, and we need to be shown the more direct reasons to hate them, what their agenda is, and how we can arm ourselves against them. So, how do we do that? Well, yeah. I think the answer is pretty obvious. It's Destiny 3. This is something that the community consistently keeps coming back to, and I think unfortunately the answer is Destiny 3 by default. 
For some, it's a bit of a controversial take because many players want to hold on to the gear that they've earned for the last seven years in D2. But ultimately, a lot of people now understand that the only way to bring Destiny back to the glory that it once knew in its best times is with a Destiny 3. The light and dark saga is done. It's time for the Winnowers saga to begin. But how do we do that while also keeping existing players narratively focused, giving us a reason to hate the Winnower, and giving new or returning players a chance to jump back in? My honest answer here has to be, I don't know. And anything involving Destiny 3 has to assess the risks of starting with a brand new slate like this, something which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. But at very least narratively, I think I have an idea for a hook. I don't like generally playing game developer, but I think this is what I would suggest. I think it's time for us to really put the Winnower front and center as a villain. I think our Guardian has to die. And I think the Winnower might be the one that kills us, or at very least, one of its minions might have to be the one that kills us. Destiny's story has had a fantastic tie-in that has been leading towards this major mystery for a very long time. Back in the corridors of time from the Season of Dawn, we discovered our own grave. And atop that grave, we saw an exotic weapon that we didn't have at the time being, a sword known as Ergo Sum. That weapon, as of the final shape, is now in our arsenal. It's a reminder of our victory over the Witness, but it's also a portent of doom, because we now know that we're on a collision course with something that is bound to end us for good. I think our Guardian needs to die, and a new character needs to inherit their power, or perhaps our Guardian needs to be resurrected. Narratively, in particular, I also think that we need a fresh slate that involves something of a time skip, something that allows us to create a clean moment that justifies wiping our loot clean and giving new players a reason to jump into the story without feeling like they've missed anything. My gut tells me that a 300-year time skip in Destiny is something that would actually help the game. It's a radical suggestion for sure, but hear me out. Firstly, we can sit there and justify the sandbox team taking another crack at things. It gives them a fresh chance to think about what balance looks like in Destiny, what fun looks like in Destiny, and how they can give us similar levels of fantastic power and yet also give us challenge that matches that. It also means they're unrestrained by things they've built up over the last seven years. If they need to, they can rewrite the rulebook again. Now, as I said before, there are a lot of players, including I'm sure in the comments section of this video, who will find that a terrible suggestion and will be unhappy because they have lost all of the ability to use their weapons in Destiny, and they will have lost the work of the last seven years in D2. However, I'm pretty sure there's also a number of people out there who at this point think a fresh start is the only thing that can really salvage the game. Secondly, on the narrative front of things, if the Winnower kills us and leaves our power within our grave for a new character to find or claim, or perhaps for us to reclaim upon resurrection, we have an excellent narrative reason to go after our main villain again. Revenge is a simple motivator, but that can also be compounded by the events of 300 years where our nemesis has been left unchallenged. And again, I don't think it necessarily has to be the Winnower directly maybe one of its peons, maybe someone who we would kill in the first iteration of this new franchise, as the Winnower remains in the background as the greater villain that we're working to defeat generally over this next saga. Regardless, it gives us the ability to stand there with a new story and with a fresh coat of paint, with a great narrative reason to be invested. You killed me, I'm coming back to get my revenge, is an excellent motivator. Thirdly, if the time skip were to accompany our death, we would have a whole new mythology of destiny to immerse players in. This might give us a chance for that fresh start for everyone. It means we all get to that nice pleasant plateau where you could reasonably say you need no knowledge of Destiny 2's past story except for one major note which is, the Winnower killed you, now you're back. Assuming that's the case, a lot of the big problems with Destiny 2 and how it feels completely impossible to invest in the story would hopefully be something that fades into the background. And the 300 year time skip also gives us something else, a new mythology for players to immerse themselves in when they land in this universe. 
Some of Destiny's best lore has its beginning in D1's grimoire cards, where the names of characters like Saint-14 and Oryx and Dredgen Yor and the Ahamkara first got noticed because they implied a greater mystery to the world. Within 300 years, new legends and new mysteries separate from us can arise and can be brought to the forefront. There are also larger changes to the world generally that could be seen with this decision. In 300 years, we might have formed a close enough link to the Elixnian Cabal that players might actually be able to choose to play as Elixni or Cabal Guardians. Yes, far-fetched. Yes, not confirmed in the lore. Yes, speculative. But would it really be impossible to throw that out there? Additionally, we might have discovered new enemies to face, enemies that would present their own stories and their own avenues for novelty. If you've been craving a new enemy combatant faction to fight, and the dread was something that served you up a little bit of freshness in Destiny, my hope would be that a Destiny 3 could bring that. This isn't even to speak on how some characters might have been impacted by a time skip. We might get to see an older and wiser Empress Keitel in the later years of her rule under a cabal that is resurgent. The role of Ikora and Zavala and Crow might have been changed entirely as humanity finds its feet and perhaps integrates more closely with Neomuna's administration on Neptune. Humanity at large might have whole new colonies established for us to explore. And of course, there might have been further calamities that we might have had to face. What is the state of Earth within 300 years? Would we even live there anymore? These are important questions, and they can be given novel answers. And then, of course, there's the prospect of characters that fascinatingly might stay the same in spite of the presence of time. The Winnower, of course, might be a key part of that, but one also has to consider the Vex, Savathun the Witch Queen, and, of course, Mara Sov. What's more is that, narratively, we can start with a new premise to this new age. We've lived through two collapses, a Dark Age, a City Age, and a Golden Age as humanity generally within Destiny's canon. So perhaps at the other end of this 300-year time skip, our return signals a new age of heroes. An age where Guardians are returning after having been mostly forgotten for the longest time. And perhaps this means that we can see a story where the Traveler is yet again imperiled, and we can focus on some of those big story questions about the light and the dark that we haven't necessarily seen the final shape answer completely. Especially now that after 300 years, the Traveler would be a changed god that is no longer familiar to us, an entity of both light and dark. That is my ideal Destiny 3 scenario. It's my solution to the narrative break that we now face at the end of the 10-year saga. But of course, I can hear people typing in the comments already. And is it realistic? Well, no, probably not. Let's talk about risks. Development for Destiny 2 needs to continue because currently, for Bungie, Destiny is the only thing that is making it any money. Creating a Destiny 3 invites an enormous risk because it basically means that most development on D2, as it currently is, has to cease. And all of that would be done in the name of a live service game launch. Which, oh goodness, um... For those of you who somehow don't know who have been in this space, live service games tend to not launch that well. I don't remember even a single one that has launched flawlessly that has also gotten mass market reception and acclaim. Yeah, this is going to be a bad one no matter what happens. Maybe Bungie will have learned after having 10 years of being in the industry and having market leadership experience, but the likelihood is there will be something that goes wrong. With Destiny 2, it was the XP throttling controversies and the realization that the game lacked the depth that Destiny 1 used to have in spades. This, combined with the absolutely abominable launch of Curse of Osiris, would leave the game struggling in its infancy. With Anthem, it was a chronic lack of content and an outright refusal by Bioware to listen to fans and improve the game's core systems that should have been more rewarding. Not to mention the failure to implement other practices that were commonplace within the looter space that would have made their game feel better and would have just been common sense. With Warframe, it was a slow start until it was eventually buoyed by exposure granted to it by reviewers and content creators as its promise as a game began to get realized. Digital Extremes in documentaries has stated how slowly Warframe started. It was a gamble and it would take a long time for this project to actually become something that they hoped it would one day be. 
This is part of the reason why Warframe has taken 10 years to build. They built their success on a long, hard path to victory, but it was also a very risky one and could have failed very near the beginning because honestly, there were probably many scary moments inside that office. And let's not talk about more recent iterations of live services. I don't intend to make a butt out of any jokes like Concord or Suicide Squad because ultimately developers are losing their jobs or have already lost their jobs on those projects. But I think just mentioning their names, yeah, it means you get the picture. Destiny, I think, partially stood the test of time and was forgiven for its missteps because players knew that there was the promise of a 10-year journey. But this next time around, players might not be so forgiving. They might not be willing to give as many second chances to Bungie when the looter market is filled with really strong competition and when players are already at the end of their tether. But, in my mind, this is the only reasonable path forward for Destiny's narrative, and honestly, for the game generally. The game is in a sorry state, and I am an optimist, and I don't believe that it is over. But I have to assess reality. And I have to sit there and I have to acknowledge that regardless of how good the game is doing right now, because of the way that Bungie is, its future is questionable. The game needs new leadership. The game needs a new, fresh place to start. The community needs reasons to hope. The community needs a boost in morale. And the game generally needs new blood and new players in order to make it work. These issues have all combined to create something of a near insurmountable task for Bungie. It is entirely possible for them to chart those waters, and I think that the developers that are working on Destiny, being as talented as they are, are capable of doing that. But unfortunately, I am not talking about the whole of Bungie when I say the developers, because the developers are being stymied by poor leadership, a perpetual bad news cycle for the game, poor player morale that's continuing to tick downwards, and a story cliffhanger that let people walk away from the game without a reason to stick around and care about what happened next. Destiny has seen the equivalent of its Lich King expansion. Arthas has died, but there is no expansion on the horizon to save us. In my opinion, Bungie needs to build that next big thing as quickly as possible. More importantly, they need to confirm to us that they are building it. Ideally, yesterday. If not, I fear that things will only continue to get worse and worse for Bungie, and of course, for Destiny. But as I also said, we just don't know what the future looks like yet. I always live in a little bit of hope, because not living with a little bit of hope means that, ultimately, what are you here to do? Just sit in a space where you just hate something? But I also believe that we need to be able to sit there and offer solutions and critique and call something bad when it genuinely is bad. The situation right now isn't just bad, it's pretty terrible. There is a way back, but Bungie needs to actively choose to take that path. And even though I'm sure the developers that work there and slave away on our game day by day, who are absolutely devoted to their craft and who believe in the promise of what they're making, even though I think they have the gumption, I don't think leadership does. That's the thing that worries me. So those are the problems that ail Destiny, and those are what I think the solutions are. Hopefully you agree, and hopefully the video was at very least helpful. One last little thing, and I'm sure I'll get some flack for saying this, I don't care. If you actually take a look at Destiny right now, and you separate the narrative that's going around currently, the bad morale, the miasma of bad everything that's going on, at the very least in my realm of the game, to do with the narrative and the story, there's some really impressive stuff going on. The exotic mission might be some of the only stuff we have to chow down on in this third act. They are doing good things with that exotic mission and with the narrative and the story. They are telling things that have terrifying principles and dropping lore beats that wind together what I think is genuinely the first decent Vex story that we've had in the game. There is lore stuff that leads us to interesting places, I think genuinely, it's not bad. It's actually pretty good. If I was ranking this against other seasons, I'd put it fairly high. That's not how players are going to remember this section of Destiny. They're going to remember this part of Destiny's timeline, not because of any enjoyable story, but instead because of the terrible moments where people got laid off and where the game's player count plummeted. 
and where the game just seemed to get worse and worse from a perception side of things. I guess what I'm trying to say is, the proof is in the pudding. Yes, everything that's surrounding Destiny is bad, and the situation is genuinely terrible. The actual game itself is actually doing some pretty cool things right now. It's just not allowed to breathe under the miasma of everything that's going on. That's not universally the case. I certainly am not talking for the PvP crowd. I certainly am not talking for the endgame crowd. I'm certainly not talking for people who used to raid in Destiny on the regular to try and get weapon rolls, and who now just don't. I'm not talking for any of those people. I'm talking for my own part of the game. At the very least, I can sit there and say, I at very least know that there's a good game buried under all this crap. I just really hope that we can solve these pressing issues for Destiny so that everyone else can experience that. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and leave a like and leave your own thoughts down below in the comments. Also do note, as I've said before, I'm expanding out into other games. At some point later this week, I'll be doing content on Space Marine 2, and there are other things planned for the future. I talked about Dragon Age Veilguard on Twitter, and covering the lore of that series generally. I want to do this with a multitude of games. If there are stories out there worth telling, I want to tell them. So, if you're interested in any of that, go ahead, stick around, and subscribe. But, in the meantime, know that your viewership as always has been quite enough for me, and that my name has been, my name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.